What you heard in the first three presentations uh, was sort of an, an overview and an introduction, uh, an, an anatomy uh, course, and some discussion about uh, how the immune system works and how, how it becomes dysfunctional. Now what we're going to move into for the greater part of the rest of today is to talk about in a, in a more uh, a macro level what are the diseases that are part of this broad spectrum of neuroimmunologic disorders that transverse myelitis uh, is an example of. And if, if you memorized my uh, editor's column in the last newsletter, uh, you might remember that um, I talked about how the Transverse Myelitis Association really advocates not just for people who have transverse myelitis, but also for people who have acute dissemina disseminated encephalomyelitis and uh, optic neuritis and Devix disease. And those are some of what we're going to be talking about along with uh, MS. Uh, the rest of today. And to begin this next section of our program, uh, Dr. Dr. David Arani is going to be talking about ADEM. Okay, thanks again, Sandy, for that introduction. It's going to be um, a long couple of days in terms of our schedule. We've set a pretty aggressive uh, itinerary of, of talks, and um, uh, it's a long time to sit, and we want people to be able to pace themselves here and come and go as you please. So I think, uh, again, I can speak on behalf of all my colleagues who are lecturing. If you need to get up, go take a break, get something to drink, come back. We're, um, we're very used to our audience uh, coming and going from medical and scientific meetings, so um, per, uh, please feel free to, to do that. So um, the... Um, the subject I'm going to talk about is a, a group of disorders that we lump together and call acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM. Some people say ADEM. Um, I may flip back and forth unintentionally between the terminology. Bear with me. Um, and what I want to do, and you're going to hear about ADEM, um, not just from me. Uh, I flipped through the syllabus. It, it looks like it shows up in Dr. Kerr's transverse myelitis lecture a little bit. Um, Dr. Barnes later on is going to talk about um, ADEM in the pediatric population. Um, so you're going to hear a lot of uh, discussion there about the clinical and laboratory uh, features of the disease in, in uh, children. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's not mentioned um, uh, in Dr. Weinschenker's talk later in the afternoon um, about therapies. Um, what I want to do uh, is to sort of get back to the theme that I, I brought up when I introduced um, our session this morning, focus mostly on this question about uh, triggering of this disease. Um, so as I alluded to earlier, um, we think in a lot of these uh, neuroimmunological disorders, um, there's something that happens that precipitates the disease. There may be some people who are more likely to get these diseases than others. So Dr. Calabresi referred to um, the genetic susceptibility. So we think your genetic makeup may make you more or less susceptible to these diseases, but that by itself doesn't tell the whole story. There's probably something that happens that triggers. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it in the context of this disease because um, uh, there are certain types of infectious diseases and certain vaccines that um, have been shown to precipitate um, uh, inflammatory demyelination in the central nervous system. And uh, I'm going to talk about two in, in some immunological detail. So I'm going to try to build a little bit of a bridge between what the folks in the other room are talking about in terms of T cells and antibodies and, and parts of the immune system. Um, and talk about it in the context of these, uh, of these uh, diseases. Um, so uh, you'll get a, a taste of uh, some of the, I'm going to introduce the clinical uh, features, but you're also going to hear about it in some of the other talks later uh, today. So there are many schemes to sort of classify or categorize um, uh, diseases, and my simple one here in terms of 
inflammatory demyelinating diseases in the central nervous system, so in the brain and the spinal cord, um, comprise conditions um, uh, including multiple sclerosis, which is a longitudinal disease with symptoms that uh, uh, come and go in a, in a relapsing remitting pattern. You're going to hear a lot about that right after me from Dr. Bowen. Um, but that's a longitudinal um, disease over time. I'm going to talk about ADM, which most of the times is a monophasic disease. It happens as a one-time event, um, but it can affect multiple different parts of the nervous system when it happens. Of course, there are the, the more sight-restricted restric disorders. Transverse myelitis, perhaps, is the best example of that, where it's really uh, uh, predominantly or exclusively just in one spot in the nervous system, in the spinal cord. Um, so there's a whole scheme in terms of uh, uh, disease duration and how much it affects uh, multiple or single parts of the nervous system. Now, down at the bottom, under the dotted line, is uh, something that we um, talk about uh, as a laboratory or an animal model of uh, inflammatory demyelinating diseases called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, or EAE. And again, a lot of the people, a lot of the scientists in the other room study this disease in the laboratory from a, an immunological standpoint, and we hope that those studies will educate us as to what's happening in human diseases and provide lessons. So um, this is sort of the overall scheme. Uh, now, in terms of what these, what these diseases or what this group of diseases encompass, um, so I mentioned that they're, they're characterized by inflammation and demyelination in the, in the nervous system. Um, they're typically um, very rapid in onset, so patients, whether you're a pediatric patient or adult patient, can get sick very quickly. Um, and it's characterized by involvement of multiple different parts of the nervous system, typically. Um, uh, maybe just in the brain, um, uh, but in different parts of the brain. It may involve the brain and the spinal cord. It's quite variable in terms of its pattern. Um, and one of the important points that I want to hammer home here is that many cases of ADEM are shown to occur on the immediate heels of infectious illnesses and on the heels of certain vaccinations. Now, I, I want to make clear here that um, this is not a, a, a message that vaccines are unsafe. Um, the vaccine uh, science is a very advanced field, and the vaccines that are currently used today are extremely uh, safe products. And I'm not at all advocating that patients avoid getting a vaccination. In fact, I'm going to use an example of a vaccine that's really not used anymore. Um, but I think it makes some uh, immunological points that I want to bring out. Um, and as I mentioned, these are usually one-time monophasic syndro uh, syndromes. There are occasional examples of, of uh, ADEM which come back with recurrences or evolve into a, a relapsing or remitting pattern, but that's the small minority of cases. Most of the time, it's a one-time uh, event. So how do we diagnose this disorder? And one of the points I made earlier when I spoke was we need to develop more rigorous, uniform diagnostic uh, criteria for, for these rare neuroimmunologic disorders. Um, but we currently don't have a single test that um, identifies this particular uh, disease. So the diagnosis is rendered by means of putting together a lot of information, um, information that you derive from talking to the patient about what's happened in the recent past um, before the onset of symptoms. And again, I'm going to focus on uh, recent infections and recent vaccinations uh, or immunizations as potential triggers. Um, the, the physical and neurological examination um, demonstrates evidence of involvement of more than one part of the nervous system. Uh, MRI imaging is a cornerstone here in helping us identify patients with this disease. The lesions in the myelin, predominantly in the white matter, but also in the gray matter, um, show up very readily on MRI scans. And even though the pattern is very different from one patient to the next, there are general patterns that we can uncover by doing MRI imaging that help us identify uh, the, and diagnose this disease. We, we commonly analyze the cerebrospinal fluid by doing a lumbar puncture, and that reflects evidence of overactivity of the immune system. That was, again, another, one of the themes that you're going to hear over and over today with too many white blood cells, elevated levels of proteins, and putting all these pieces of 
information together help us um, to arrive at a diagnosis. Um, we often use the response to therapy as a, a help, helpful tool to decide whether the patient really has ADM or not. Um, many times um, we use uh, corticosteroid treatments um, uh, in the acute phase of the illness to try to reduce inflammation and facilitate uh, recovery. We want that bad inflammation to get under control as quickly as possible before there's any collateral damage to nerves and myelin in the, in the nervous system to, to, to maximize the chance of, of recovery. And of course, um, following patients over time in terms of their clinical um, uh, features and what their MRI is doing is very helpful in, in clarifying the diagnosis over time. So here's an example um, uh, of MRI imaging from patients um, that uh, developed ADEM um, uh, following a, a vaccination. This was actually um, patients um, from Thailand who had received um, uh, the older form of the simple rabies vaccine, which is the vaccine I'm going to talk about. And uh, the point here is, is that the, the, the lesions in the white matter show up very readily on the, on the MRI scan. This patient also had very prominent involvement in the cervical spinal cord with this high signal intensity. Uh, the point is, is that um, these lesions in this disease can uh, occur in multiple parts of the nervous system simultaneously over time. And the MRI is very useful in identifying them and clarifying the diagnosis. The problem is, though, when you look at an MRI like that, um, many times it looks very much like the MRI of a patient with multiple sclerosis. And if uh, uh, one of the quandaries we face is, is this um, clinical symptoms um, and disease that's manifest in the patient, the first attack of multiple sclerosis, so what will turn out to be a relapsing remitting pattern, or is it a single isolated event that may recover and not come back? So discriminating ADEM from multiple sclerosis can be very difficult. Um, I scanned this scheme out of a, a, a review article um, to highlight some of the differences, um, but, but the bottom line is the MRI, um, can show very similar changes and it's often difficult to tell until we get more at the molecular um, mechanisms in these diseases will we only then be able to develop tests that may more reliably distinguish these two uh, conditions. Both um, uh, ADM and MS are characterized by uh, overactive uh, 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 immune responses within the nervous system. The spinal fluid is commonly abnormal. They show an elevated number of white blood cells. Um, but there are some subtle differences um, in the types of proteins that are present that sometimes help distinguish ADM from uh, MS. So what I really want to concentrate on is not um, details about the clinical features of this disease. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about it later this afternoon, so I'm not pushing it aside and ignoring it, but I want to focus on this question of what precipitates or triggers it. because. Um, I think that's a very important, if we can understand what activates the immune system here, those may provide very valuable lessons that will carry over into other neuroimmunologic uh, uh, disorders, transverse myelitis um, uh, and the like. And so many things are known to be associated with the onset of um, uh, ADEM, and the two that I'm going to concentrate on uh, this morning are um, the disease that follows uh, a certain type of vaccine. Uh, and the disease that follows a certain type of infection. Um, and I'm going to leave um, the idiopathic and drug-induced and traumatic and other ones aside um, in all honesty because, we, uh, honesty because we don't understand them very well. So um, ADM has been epidemiologically linked to follow on the heels of a number of vaccines, but the most prominent one is a vaccine that's actually no longer used anymore, um, and it's the old simple rabies vaccine. Um, and I'm going to take you through the history of that because I think it's instructive. Um, but the bottom line is that this is not a condition um, that you see anymore because this vaccine isn't used uh, anymore. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, ADEM that follows measles virus infection. Now, again, measles isn't a very common disease anymore here in the developed world because of the measles vaccine and how well that works. Um, uh, but it is still a problem worldwide, and it raises the question of uh, other infectious illnesses and, and triggering this condition. So if we can study this and understand it from a clinical and an immunological standpoint, 
The question is, does it provide clues to other infectious triggers um, uh, for these diseases? And Dr. Calabresi um, uh, made points uh, in his previous talk about things that we think precipitate multiple sclerosis. And again, infectious uh, disease um, has been um, uh, one uh, very uh, active uh, area of investigation. So I just want to take you through the history here because I think it's informative. It goes back to the late 1800s and the time of Louis Pasteur. Um, and they uh, uh, knew about rabies, uh, which is a viral infection that causes a fatal neurological disorder. And it was Pasteur figured out that he could prevent um, the development of rabies in someone who had been bit by a rabid, rabid animal or exposed to rabies by injecting that patient with uh, tissue, brain tissue or spinal cord tissue from an animal that had rabies. So this is a very early principle of vaccination. You're training the immune system to respond to rabies with the vaccine in an effort to try to prevent the actual disease. The problem, of course, is, is that when you inject rabies-infected material into a patient, you may actually transmit the disease itself. And so that was one of the big drawbacks of this. But then they figured out that, um, that there were ways you could inactivate the virus and use a tissue um, uh, that had been exposed to a phenol that killed the virus, but then you could inject that material into humans and prevent the development of rabies, and it was very effective at doing that. Uh, so um, it's easy to make this. The vaccine was then cheap and readily available and widely used in the developed uh, world. The problem is, is that um, uh, uh, over time, it became clear when you took a tissue homogenate of, of, of uh, uh, spinal cord or brain tissue and injected it into a human that occasionally patients developed neurological complications from the vaccine, um, uh, so-called neuroparalytic accidents. And that's been best studied in uh, the developing world, particularly in Thailand, where there happens to be a lot of rabies. So um, over time, it became clear that about one out of 400 patients who received this vaccine would develop an inflammatory demyelinating um, disease on the heels of the vaccine. So that one out of 400 complication rate is absolutely unacceptable by today's standard as a vaccine. We would not tolerate a flu vaccine or a hepatitis vaccine that caused this degree of disease. Um, and that's why this, disease, this vaccine is, is no longer used. Um, but uh, it is instructive. Um, and uh, uh, so investigators um, were able to collect patients who develop these complications and uh, study them clinically and um, take lymphocytes, um, blood samples uh, from these patients and compare them to patients who had received the vaccine that didn't get complications to try to understand the immunology and what was being triggered by the vaccine to cause the disease, what was different in the patients that got these neuroparalytic accidents um, versus those who didn't. And they come in all sorts of forms. It can be predominantly a brain problem with inflammation in the brain causing encephalitis. It can become pr predominantly a spinal cord, cord problem and cause myelitis uh, or can com a combination thereof. They were rare. Um, and heterogeneous, uh, but uh, there were ways, as I'll tell you in just a second, to study samples from these patients um, to help us understand what, what causes a vaccine to trigger this sort of problem. So in terms of the time course here, um, these complications develop relatively soon after the vaccine was started, within a few days. So this is not something that happens months later, and it's the same message as with post-infectious um, encephalomyelitis, that it's something that typically happens as the infection is waning, not something that crops up months or years after uh, an infectious illness. So these inflammatory demyelinating complications of vaccines and of, of infections happen soon after the inciting event. And so this is the time course in terms of days after the injection. And, and with this vaccine, you're actually getting multiple injections over a period of a couple of weeks. Um, in terms of the outcome from this uh, disease, it turned out that it, it um, usually was a fairly short-lived illness. So the duration of the disease and the majority of the patients studied in this, um, in this paper 
um, had disease that lasted a week or two, although a very small subset had a more chronic disease, and, a, and there was one patient that actually had a relapsing remitting pattern. But by and large, this was a one-time disease that came, produced neurological symptoms, and resolved itself either partially or completely. Uh, many patients actually made a complete recovery, although some didn't. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the immunology of uh, these patients, and Dr. Calabresi introduced you to the concept of different cells of the immune system. We focus a lot on uh, a cell type called the T cell, and that's a normal part of the immune system that helps us fight off infection, but it turns out that T cells are important players in causing neuroimmunologic disease, and in this particular um, uh, example, um, we think that T cells were triggered to respond to myelin proteins and cause the disease. So if you think about it, if you inject um, nervous system tissue into an animal, you can cause uh, demyelination, and that's what this EAE disease is. And if you, in fact, in, if you inject nervous system tissue into a human, you can um, prime the immune system to respond to proteins in myelin, and one of the most well-studied is something called myelin basic protein. It doesn't, work, doesn't matter about the details here. This is a normal protein in myelin, and if your T cells start to react to myelin basic protein, it can damage the myelin sheath that Dr. Pardo talked about, cause the myelin to be stripped off, and cause neurological symptoms. So in this study, what they did was they looked at patients who um, had received the vaccine who didn't get any neurological complications in comparison to patients who had received the vaccine and did develop neurological complications. And they asked the question, were the responses of the T cells from these patients different when they put them in a, in a Petri dish and cultured them with purified myelin basic protein? And the answer is yes. So something called a stimulation index it, the, again, the details are not important, but it just means how actively the cells respond to this protein when you add it to the culture. And um, a stimulation index of one is, is normal. So uncomplicated vaccine recipients did not have T cells that responded in this type of assay to myelin basic protein, but patients that did have neurological complications had um, very active um, neural, uh, active immunological responses to myelin basic protein. So the act of injecting the protein into the patient, in some of those patients it triggered the immune system to respond to the myelin protein, and the hypothesis here is that those myelin-specific T cells went into the nervous system and caused the neurological disease. Turns out not only were the, the T cells activated, but when you inject these, um, these substances into humans, um, it causes the production of antibody molecules, um, uh, which are another component of the immune system. And so this is just a, a, um, a figure from, the, from this paper showing that the antibody responses to myelin proteins were higher in patients that developed the neurological complications from this vaccine compared to the patients who didn't develop the complications. And those antibodies were present in the blood, in the serum, and they were also present in the spinal fluid. And again, the idea is that if you induce these antibodies, that they may go into the nervous system, bind to the myelin that's all over the, the nerve cells, and cause damage to the myelin, and produce neurological symptoms. So there's something about this vaccine that triggered this abnormal immune response in a subset of patients uh, to cause the disease. And um, people who are interested in this have worked out some of the details. So in this group of patients, three quarters of them had um, antibodies against this myelin basic protein uh, molecule, and they were able to study which parts of the molecule were particularly um, uh, uh, targets of the immune system. Again, the details here aren't um, important. The message is, is that if you make, or, or if your body is triggered to make antibodies to this myelin protein, they have the potential uh, to get inside the nervous system and cause disease, which is, of course, something that we don't want to have happen. So understanding how that happens is a very critical aspect in being able to uh, intervene early and maybe even prevent these diseases. <coughs> 
Um, and this is just more data from one of these studies showing that the different types of antibodies were different in the complication versus the non-complication uh, vaccine um, recipients. Again, I, I don't want to um, get into too much detail about the, the, the specifics of the findings. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't had a lot of uh, a background in the immune system, uh, it can get a little overwhelming. You saw Dr. Calab one of Dr. Calabrese's last slides with arrows going everywhere in terms of cells talking to each other. It's, it's nightmarishly complicated, and, and I don't want to get bogged down in the details here, but suffice it to say that this vaccine has been shown in a, in a, in a subset of patients to trigger um, antibody responses and T-cell responses to myelin basic protein, and we think that's why these patients developed these, um, these uh, neurological complications and developed this disease, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Now, one of the other things that gets at um, why some patients got this disease and why some patients didn't get this disease um, has to do with uh, uh, features of their genetic background. Um, and gets, again, gets a little bit complicated, bear with me. Um, uh, there are certain types of molecules that um, are on the surface of our cells that activate the immune system. And these so-called HLA molecules are very important in um, turning on T cells, okay? And there are many different types. And the type of HLA molecules that are in my body may be different than the types of HLA molecules that are in um, other people's bodies. And you don't have all the types. Some people have some types and other people have other types. But the hypothesis is, and it's been shown in other diseases as well, if you have certain type of HLA molecules, which are known as DR, HLA-DR, and there are, again, many different types, you may be more susceptible or less susceptible to autoimmune disease. And so these investigators wanted to know in patients who had received this vaccine, was there a link between certain HLA-DR molecules and the likelihood of getting the disease? And it turned out there was. So in the patients that got the neurological complication, they were much more likely to have HLA-DR9 and HLA-DR17 compared to patients that didn't get the complications or that didn't get the vaccine. Again, the message here is, is that this may be a susceptibility factor. So if you've got these types of HLA proteins on your cells, you may be more likely to get this kind of complication from this vaccine. And we, we know similar things in multiple sclerosis. So if you have certain HLA-DR molecules you're much more likely to get multiple sclerosis than if you don't have the cules. And it gets at the point that this is a s very potentially a, a susceptibility factor. And so that helps us now understand why some patients are more likely to get these diseases than others. And if we know the subset of people who are more likely to get these diseases, we're more likely to be able to identify them and maybe even prevent these things from happening. Now that's quite a bit of a jump. Um, but determining who's more likely to get a DEM following a vaccine uh, may allow you to say, well, maybe I wouldn't give that vaccine to those types of, of patients. So understanding these susceptibility factors, and there are many of them, um, but in the, in the HLA molecules um, uh, is a very important um, uh, aspect of these studies. And we think it's because if you've got these types of molecules, you're more likely to activate the myelin-specific T cells and get the disease. So it's a, a genetic susceptibility factor. So I want to jump now to um, uh, something that's maybe a little bit more realistic. Injecting people with um, uh, ground-up spinal cord from uh, rabbits or goats is not done anymore. Um, but measles is, a, is an infectious illness that is a, um, present worldwide. It's not such a big deal in the developed world because of the uh, very effective measles vaccine. So again, my message here is that vac it's not that we need to avoid vaccines, we just need to have safe ones. Um, but in patients who contract measles, which is one of the normal childhood infectious illnesses, uh, it has been identified that a small percentage of them develop 
uh, this disease, which is a form of an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM, um, that follows immediately on the heels of measles infection, okay? And this is a, actually a more severe disease than the, the, the example I showed you earlier. Um, it can be fatal in 10 to 20 percent of, of patients. Um, now, what this is not is evidence of measles virus infecting the nervous system. It's not a, it's not a complication, a direct complication of the virus getting into the brain. It's something different. And when um, investigators started to study this, it looked like an inflammatory demyelinating disease under the microscope, um, and it looked like it on MRI um, that had a lot of similarities to um, other inflammatory demyelinating diseases. And so the hypothesis was that in some patients, getting this infection triggers an immune response um, uh, that, that, that uh, drives the disease. So again, it's very soon after the uh, infection. Um, it's not something that happens months later. Um, and these patients who get the, get the disease also have T cells that react to this myelin basic protein, um, whereas patients who don't get it don't. So again, it's associated with triggering these myelin reactive T cells and causing the disease. Now, we don't know exactly how that happens. Dr. Calabresi talked about this molecular mimicry hypothesis, but the point is, is that in a subset of patients, they trigger these uh, immune responses, these activated T cells go into the nervous system, they damage the myelin, um, and maybe even the nerves themselves, and they cause acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Uh, let's see. Trying to go back one. Sorry. So this is just a table that shows you some of the similarities between this, this vaccine-induced encephalomyelitis, this post-infectious uh, encephalomyelitis, and the animal model, this EAE. Um, and the point here is, is that in a subset of patients um, who are susceptible to this, the immune system is triggered to react to myelin, uh, either by the vaccine or by virus, and that sets up a cascade of events that causes acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Now, you're not, again, you're not likely to see these diseases anymore, but the point is, is they're a template to help us study why other viruses or other infections might trigger this. And if we understand the mechanisms there, we may be able to devise more effective treatments that facilitate recovery um, uh, in patients who develop these or even prevent them from happening in the first place. So let me wrap up um, to help us keep on schedule here. This is an inflammatory demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. Usually it's a monophasic illness, a one-time course. Um, it often occurs on the heels of a vaccine uh, or an infectious illness. And uh, we think that somehow these um, uh, triggers uh, activate the immune system in an abnormal way to react to myelin, and these myelin uh, basic protein-specific immune responses are what drive the disease. So if we can study and understand how we get from here to here, we may be able to block it or um, turn those react responses off to the benefit of our patients. I think that's my last slide. So thanks very much for your attention. I'll be available to answer questions. Good. Good afternoon, everybody, and I'm sure we're all wide awake after that lecture on fatigue and lunch. Uh, so now I'm going to take you through some of my thoughts on spasticity management. And uh, I'd like to point out that uh, one of the, of the basic management techniques for spasticity was practiced a long time ago in Thailand, which is stretching muscles, stretching stiff muscles, because one of the uh, things that spasticity causes is tightness of joints and, and muscles. So whatever else I say about adjuncts to, treat, to treating spasticity, I'd like us to keep in, in uh, mind that whatever else we can do to relax stiff muscles, st uh, s s stretching and ma maintaining joint position is the primary intervention for this condition. Uh, I'd uh, like to start with, with this slide here, which I 
borrowed from uh, one of my colleagues who treats cerebral palsy. And um, the reason that it's up here is I want to point out the different kinds of intervention and the different levels of, of, of medical intervention that can be used for treating spasticity. Uh, the interventions on this slide are divided into rehabilitative interventions, which are classified as physical and occupational therapy, medical interventions, which would in, include things such as uh, therapeutic botulinum toxin injections and oral medications, and surgical interventions. And now we have multiple different kinds of surgical interventions, namely uh, orthopedic surgery, which has been a mainstay over the years of uh, treating joint contractures, which is a complication of spasticity. Dorsal ry rhizotomy, which is a, a uh, neurosurgical procedure where you decrease the sensory stimulation to the nervous system. And intrathecal baclofen, which is a, a surgical procedure where a, pro a programmable pump is placed into the, um, uh, in, into t to the back and then a flexible catheter slowly in infuses the medication directly into the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, today we're going to talk mostly about the medical interventions, uh, but I wanted you to see that there's pretty much uh, uh, different levels of intervention and, and it, it works like uh, other algorithms where you might try different things at different times, depending on the condition of the patient. Well, I think it's a fair question to, to, uh, to mention, well, what are the reasons for treating spasticity? Why, why do we do it? And I think it's mostly because of the impact of spasticity on the musculoskeletal system. There's different goals that we have. Reducing pain or spasm frequency, increasing range of motion so that an individual can access their en en environment by uh, reaching more easily, more, more quickly, and having a greater uh, range of motion with uh, both their legs and their arms. Cosmesis is a reason for treating uh, spasticity um, so that uh, things don't poke out at times that you don't want them to poke out, such as elbows when you're going through doors. Hygiene, so that an individual with, with tight elbow flexors can be cleaned more easily, both under the arms, let's say, or in the elbow creases. Sorry. Uh, fitting for braces or uh, or or orthoses. Uh, a lot of times a physician will prescribe a plastic brace uh, to give uh, the patient a more stable base from which to stand and, and they can't fit into them because the AFOs cause blistering or redness because the toes want to point down related to spasticity. So that would be a reasonable reason for treating uh, uh, gastrocnemius or calf muscle tightness so they can fit into their braces. Postpone or avoid surgery, and the kind of surgeries I'm talking about are pretty much orthopedic surgery. This is something that we uh, worry about in uh, children more than adults because there does seem to be an optimal time for correcting uh, joint contractures in children, but we want to give them time to grow and for their bones to grow. And uh, finally, I think the bottom line with the reason for why to treat spasticity is to prevent uh, this medical, what, what, what doctors call contractures, and I think we should spend some time talking about what exactly a joint contracture is. Uh, again, this, this is more pertinent toward pediatric patient, uh, but, but I think it does give us some uh, insights into, into how muscles respond in the face of uh, spastic muscle tone. Let's go. I'm hitting the up button when I mean the down button. Here we go. So normal stretching is needed for proper muscle growth. And this goes back to the concept, if you, if you don't use it, you lose it. So if, uh, if muscles aren't stretched, if they're not uh, put through their range of motion, they'll actually physically sh shorten. They'll uh, lose what's, what's called their sarcomere units, which are their contractile elements that cause them to contract and expand. So if you don't use your muscles, they'll, they'll, they'll physically shorten. Muscle length increases in response to bone growth, so you can see in a child that's growing, their muscles are going to grow at the same time. If those muscles are unable to grow because of spasticity, uh, 
uh, but the bone is still growing, you're going to get gradual loss of range of motion when those muscles cross joints. So in those muscles that cross joints, which are spastic, again, more, more so in children than adults, you're going to get loss of range of motion. And uh, a lot of our, our rehabilitation techniques are directed toward uh, preventing that from happening. Muscle Im Im imbalance from spasticity limits the lengthening possible with muscle growth. So these are reasons, uh, these are some of the things that connect bone growth to muscles and why it's important to, to prevent uh, contractures from occurring. Uh, we'll, we'll oftentimes talk about two different kinds of contractures. One of them is called dynamic contractures. This is an early finding in cerebral palsy, but also is present in individuals with other forms of central nervous system injury, such as spinal cord injury, seen with transverse myelitis. It causes an imbalance between the muscles acting on a joint, and it results in abnormal mus muscle motion and function. So a dynamic att contracture occurs when the individual is trying to do something or to move a muscle, move a, move a limb, use a muscle to move a limb, sorry. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a dynamic contracture, you can attain a normal range of motion with a passive stretch. It might be difficult to stretch that tight muscle out, but you can get to the normal range of motion with a dynamic contraction. This is compared or contrasted to a fixed contracture. These are often in inevitable. They require surgical lengthening to restore muscle balance when they occur. And when you go the surgical route, on occasion, again, more so in children than adults, reoperation is often necessary. So if you're going to uh, uh, suggest an operation on, on someone with a fixed contracture, uh, uh, it should be uh, done at the optimal time so that you're not having to do the operation over again. Uh, here are some, some pictures, some examples by of, of what we uh, see in individuals who have severe spasticity, uh, and they can affect multiple joints, uh, the toes uh, here, uh, equino varus, which is an in-toeing, an, an inward movement of the foot toward the midline. Here's what's called a striatal toe, or an upgoing toe from a, a toe extensor contracture. Stiff knees can occur from a hamstring contracture, all, all related to spasticity. Knee flexion can occur where you can't straighten out your knees, and tightness of your thighs or scissoring can also occur from tight muscles or spastic muscles. And uh, the same can occur with various joints in the upper limbs, uh, again related to tight muscles that cross joints, such as the elbow and the shoulder and the, and the wrist joints. Um, one way to look at uh, interventions for uh, uh, treating spasticity are to uh, think of it in terms of interventions that are either general or focal, uh, either reversible or permanent. And in this uh, uh, table, uh, it's divided into four quadrants. And so, for example, in this first quadrant here, oral medications and intrathecal baclofen can be considered as two interventions that work on the body as a whole but are re reversible interventions. This is contrasted to a selective dorsal ry rhizotomy, which will affect uh, a muscle tone in multiple muscles in the, in the lower limbs, depending on how many nerve roots are, are cut, and is also a permanent because it is a surgical procedure. In the bottom half of the diagram, in this box, uh, chemodenervation, that's, that's my term for in injections to specific muscles, uh, and these would be injections with things such as uh, a Botox or botulinum neurotoxin and uh, phenol. These would be considered reversible focal interventions. And then local corrective surgery would be an example of a permanent focal intervention, depending on which muscle is being treated. We're going to talk today mostly about uh, 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 general re reversible interventions oral uh, medications and chemo denervation. So uh, I, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about Botox. It's been out there now for about 10 years in terms of treating spasticity. So most of you have heard about Botox, you know how it works, uh, but I thought I'd go over uh, briefly some of, some of the background about how Botox was developed and um, 
I'd then talk to you about some of the things that I've learned through my e experiences over the last uh, 10 years or so in using Botox in individuals with spasticity. Uh, in the 1700s, it, uh, botulinum uh, was identified as being caused by the Clostridium botulinum bacteria. It was purified by Dr. Shantz in 1944, and then Dr. Scott around 1968 came up with the idea of using it for medical reasons. And he's an ophthalmologist, so interestingly enough, the first indications were for treating uh, 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 muscles uh, around the eye that caused uh, uncontrollable eye blinking or blepharospasm. Uh, pretty soon it got in the, into the popular press. This was an article that appeared in the National en Enquirer, which I've been told nobody reads, but people's friends read or relatives read. Uh, uh, but no one that I know reads it. <laughs> uh, when the article came out, um, uh, I got a call from Scotland saying that, you know, I'd read this article, what do you think about it? I said, well, it's uh, probably going to uh, uh, be, a, be a big help for, so, for some children, but I don't think it's a miracle drug. So let's, let's talk about that for a while. Uh, as I mentioned, it comes from a gram-positive anaerobic rod, which is a kind of bacteria. Uh, this bacteria produces eight different kinds of neurotoxin. Currently, uh, Types A and B have been marketed. Uh, it's the most potent uh, toxin known with a lethal dose of 1 to 2 micrograms. And the incidence of botulinum poisoning is about 10 cases per year in the United States. That's oral, not injectable <laughs> botulinum toxin. Uh, the way the medication works is it focuses down here at the neuromuscular junction. So this is a diagram of the central nervous system. The nerves come down from the brain to the spinal cord, and then the nerves come off the spinal cord and, and interact with the muscle fibers here. This picture here is a uh, microscopic view of these nerve endings right down here. And then this cartoon here is a picture of the neuromuscular junction, which is right around there. And what this shows is the release of these acetylcholine molecules that are the neurotransmitter which activate muscles. What Botox does is it blocks the release of these little vesicles that are filled with the acetylcholine. So uh, here's an example, uh, well not an example, but here's a slide that shows what we know about the molecular structure of the botulinum neurotoxin molecule. It's got two chains, a light and a heavy chain and it blocks the release of acetylcholine right there at the neuromuscular junction. And one more slide about mechanism. Uh, when you get really into the uh, 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 chemistry about how this works, it blocks the effectiveness of one of these uh, enzymes, which are fusion enzymes, which allow these vesicles containing acetylcholine to dump their acetylcholine into the uh, neuromuscular cleft or the synaptic cleft. So by blocking these enzymes, it prevents that vesicle from releasing the uh, neurotransmitter. This is a re reversible effect, and uh, it, uh, the uh, Botulinum neurotoxin doesn't kill the nerves. It temporarily blocks this enzyme from doing its uh, job. Uh, consideration in treatment decisions. So when I see a patient with spasticity, especially focal spasticity, the things I think about are wh what kind of abnormal muscle tone do they have? Is this a, a dystonic, which means variable muscle tone activity, or is it what I would call a spastic muscle tone, which would be manifested by uh, what we call a rate-dependent de difference in resistance. When I stretch the muscle quickly or slowly, do I get a different feeling to it? A, a good rule of thumb that I tell uh, medical students uh, in terms of how do you differentiate between the two, well, the two major types of muscle tone abnormality is for you to diagnose spasticity, you have to put your hands on the patient. Spasticity is something that you feel, whereas dystonia, which is a kind of motor control abnormality, which causes muscle tone uh, uh, problems is something that you can see. So you can see d dystonia, but you have to feel spasticity. Um, 
So is it spasticity or dystonia or is it both? Uh, how long has it been there? Because this gives me some idea as to whether we have a dynamic or a fixed contracture present. If the muscle tone abnormality has been there for a longer period of time, then I think that, especially if I can't stretch that muscle out easily, I'm, I'm concerned that there are some fixed elements to the uh, spasticity and that it's not going to respond that well to chemo de denervation either with an injection of Botox or with oral medications. Severity, again, how severe is it? Which muscle groups are being affected and how many muscles are being affected? If the muscle tone abnormality affects focal muscles, that if those muscles were relaxed, there would be some benefit in function, I'd consider that uh, patient a candidate for one of these focal reversible interventions or possibly uh, irreversible if I really thought you'd get uh, long-term benefit. And sometimes we'll use a reversible intervention such as a Botox shot to decide whether or not something permanent like orthopedic surgery would, would be a benefit for that patient. Um, if the patient comes to me and they've got generalized muscle tone in both arms, both legs, trunk, and they're arching, uh, I'll say, well, you know, this it really isn't a good Botox candidate because I can't Botox everything. Uh, let's see if there are some focal muscles there that would benefit, would, would, would give you benefit if they were, were relaxed. And if not, let's try something oral or something general, such as uh, the medications. So diff diffuse versus focal and the number of candidate muscles that you have. Clinical parameters. Uh, these are just some numbers, just general numbers about, about how long Botox works. The usual onset of action is 12 to 72 hours, depending on how big the muscle is and how much Botox you give. Uh, the time to peak effect is in a general 7 to 10 days, but these are general numbers. They could vary from patient to patient. Average duration of response is about 1 to 6 months, and I think uh, I've, seen, I've seen it work for 2 weeks and I've seen it work for 12 months. So that again is a very uh, uh, de dependent on the specific reason that you gave the Botox and the patient's response to Botox. And uh, we typically say a reinjection interval should be about 12 weeks or three months. And one reason for this is that's the average duration of, of effective Botox. And another reason is there is some concern that your chances of developing neutralizing antibodies would go up if you reinjected sooner than 12 weeks. Um, one one of the um, of the themes of of this talk is that that Botox and oral medications are one part of the overall treatment plan for an individual with spasticity. Uh, there's therapy after treatment with Botox. It's not a magic bullet. It's not going to reverse the symptoms. It's got to be thought of as part of, of the treatment plan. And oftentimes I won't give Botox if there's not a well thought out uh, therapeutic plan in, in a place and that the Botox is part of that. So by well th thought out, what I mean are things such as well-made AFOs for the ankles if you're giving a Botox treat uh, shot to the ankles, uh, elbow splints if you're concerned about elbow flexion contractures, uh, a, a plan to have either the therapist stretch the individual out or an education plan so that the family can carry out stretching exercises at home. Um, so these are some of the things that, that, that I ask about. Uh, what kind of gait training will, will be going on after the treatment? Do we have everything lined up in terms of splitting, seating, and e equipment for positioning? And uh, has there been some education about the proper use of exercises and body mechanics after you've relieved the uh, increased muscle tone? Uh, by this time, I think the evidence for botulinum toxin affecting contractures is pretty good. Again, it's g I and there's been a, uh, a fair number of research studies using good clinical uh, design that show that you can make an alteration in range of motion and you can decrease the spasticity scores. In other words, someone will have a scale and they'll say, okay, before they got the Botox, I thought the score was this, and afterwards it went down to a better score. Uh, there have been relatively few articles that 
make the next step, which say, okay, I've given botulinum toxin to these stiff muscles, and now I've been able to measure a functional benefit, that the patient has derived a beneficial result from the Botox. And I think part of that's because we've spent uh, some time in the past 10 years trying to figure out exactly how to give the Botox, and also what kind of outcome measures would be most appropriate. Um, so articles are just now starting to show up in the scientific literature that say, yes, Botox can be shown to have a functional benefit. And, the, and probably the most well-known article appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine last year when they used a patient-centered outcome measure to determine the effects of botulinum toxin injection on stiff wrist muscles. And what the researchers basically did is they asked the, the uh, patients to select what they wanted the Botox to do before they got the Botox. And they gave them a list of three or four uh, possibilities. And then they asked them afterwards, did it do what you thought it would do? And this study was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial. So 